and enable transcripts. Uh, welcome everyone. We're just getting settled. We're gonna allow a few more minutes for other people to join. I don't know if you can see the participant counts. It's, uh, so we're at uh, 34 right now. It's going up. No, I've, I've turned off my video thumbnail. Otherwise, I just look at myself every time I move. <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, disconcerting when you can see yourself. Uh, so I've turned yeah. that off as well when I'm in meetings. Actually, I can only see you and I. So it must be a panelist or co-host thing. Yeah, I like just normal like work meetings, just turn that off yes. so I don't see myself. Yeah, we're hitting about 40 right now. We'll give it a few more minutes, everyone, um, to let people join. I keep telling myself next time I have this uh, sort of event or webinar to play some music as uh, people are waiting for it to start, but it hasn't happened yet. You can just listen to us banter, I suppose. Well, there you go. People <laughs> like podcasts, right? So uh, I guess this is kind of what I'm doing. Yeah. So we're at 49, hitting about 50. How's the weather over there? You know, it's surprisingly nice today. Uh, they, they promise 70s. Um, I don't know that it's there yet, but we have sun, which is pretty rare for spring in Indiana. This is my fourth spring in Indiana, and they've all been completely different from one another. Uh, it snowed Monday, about two inches, and it's supposed to be 80 on Saturday. So, there you, go. you know, normal, I guess. What about you? This is wild mountains. Um, yeah, I mean, typical Southern California, Southern California weather. Uh, I live in Orange County, so pretty close to Disneyland. So we're yeah. pretty much uh, 70s um, around this time of year. So a couple of weeks ago, it was hitting like 100. It was unusually hot. But um, yeah, so All right, I think we've kind of stabilized around 50. So I will go ahead and uh, officially kick this off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's event, Communicating Value Through Impact Statements. We are pleased to have Brandon Reese, a Certified Business Relationship Manager at Purdue University. This is the third in the three-part series that we've been hosting around relationship management topics. Um, you can check out the recordings from the other presenters on the Educause ITSM website. Presentation will go for about 40, 45 minutes with time left over at the end for Q&A. Everyone will be on mute. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A window, but we're going to hold questions until the end. So just be aware of that. Um, in the meanwhile, throughout the presentation, we encourage you to talk to each other using the chat window. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Educause ITSM website within five business days. Okay, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Brandon. Thanks so much, Mitch. Uh, thanks again for everyone attending. Good afternoon to, I think, most of you. Um, as he said, my name is Brandon Reese. I'm a business relationship manager at Purdue University. Uh, a little background that is sort of germane to this topic is that I don't have an IT background. I have a finance background. Uh, today, we're going to talk about communicating value through impact statements. And something that you do in the finance sector is a lot of reporting. Uh, while reporting in that form is important, this is a kind of different type of reporting. Uh, it's a little bit different in concept and in execution. So I'll jump into a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about some data collection and metrics, which kind of harkens back to the, the previous couple of sessions, um, a conceptual introduction to what an impact statement is, why you need one, um, how to build them, the benefits, how you use them to tell your story, uh, some particulars about knowing your audience, uh, we'll actually do a, an overview of the template we use and a, a brief demonstration of how we build them and a question and answer session. So metrics, right? Uh, what we have here is a pie chart with the what these slices are intentionally blanked out because what, what you collect will vary entirely on the type of organization or part of the organization you work in, who you consider your partners, et cetera. Um, 
our mission as business relationship managers at Purdue University is to connect agricultural faculty directly with the full potential of technology partners on and off campus. And so our metrics represent quantifiable, usually interactions uh, or outcomes to those efforts. So again, what you collect will depend on what you do and they can evolve over time. So you may start with something as simple as counts, uh, events, contacts, what we call engagements, I put N of 30 there. There's some science behind uh, reporting numbers smaller than 30 if your time frame is, say, a year or, or even six months. Uh, anything under than that, and it's, it's kind of a so what. Um, some other examples of things that, that we count are consultations with internal or external partners, partnerships or connections we make uh, across campus, uh, or other metrics that are unique to your organization that I may not have covered. Um, what they should also do is demonstrate the growing impact you have with your partner. So uh, you can go from metrics to quotes to being a, a trusted partner, and none of this is overnight. This this will take time. Um, you know, yours yours will be different than mine, but hopefully this uh, this example will will give you a place to get started. Um, and the answer to your so what question, which is really what an impact statement is supposed to answer, uh, it can take time to build, and, and we'll show an evolution of those uh, later in the talk. So you use metrics to tell your audience why what you're doing matters and to whom. S to, to be clear, metrics are not the story, they're part of the story. Um, when presenting uh, any of this to a, a stakeholder, recognize that, at least in my opinion, the metrics are akin to a roadmap that you followed, but they're not the journey. So your audience needs to understand um, at a certain level, you know, jargon of your organization, uh, technical specifications, uh, terms that you may use. Um, Purdue, as well as I imagine most higher ed institutions have a, we'll call it a tome of uh, abbreviations, acronyms, words that mean things. Uh, I have actually changed uh, positions within Purdue and had acronyms that were the same four letters mean different things as I crossed the street. So that's something to keep in mind when you're building things like this is who is going to be reading it. And we'll talk more about uh, audience specific uh, concerns later on. Um, you know, every institution is going to have a different spin on what it considers an IRB issue. So you can work with a potential audience member. Uh, maybe that is administration. Maybe that's a faculty member. Um, in our example that I will use throughout, we're working with a faculty sponsor, and that will enable us to report outside the organization with the IRB's approval. This helps us to quantify some of the qualitative research um, that they may consider uh, answering a research question and thus subject to IRB. Um, whether or not it's human subjects research, it, it's open to interpretation from each university's IRB. Uh, you may not have any of these concerns, and if you don't, that's fantastic. Um, but there are other things like data collection methods, redaction, and I wanted to touch on that because the examples I will show throughout, uh, there'll be some white spots. It's not that I forgot to type there, it's that I have redacted things like faculty names, um, and in some cases, uh, technology products. You may have concerns for other intellectual property. Um, these can help uh, impact statements can help educate your audience as well as help to show the impact being made by other teams in your organization. Uh, I talked about collecting metrics. I've talked about you know, concerns, but okay, what what is an impact statement? So I don't expect anyone to be able to, to read this. And again, as Mitch mentioned, the, the slides will be available. Um, we'll, we'll go into a bigger version of this later, but this is sort of how uh, this looks as a one page document. I don't generally read from slides, but I think this bit up here is important. This is sort of our definition that we came up with. An impact statement is a narrative or story that details the way people, communities, businesses, operations, et cetera, are affected as a result of research and extension efforts. But really, these questions answer the, these answer the questions of so what and who cares. Um, we use them to consistently inform a given audience about a group, team, or, or in, even individual successes. You know, some examples of potential audiences, uh, primary audiences, we'll call them organizational leadership. You know, that may be your direct superior, that may be the person in charge of your division or department, but that could also be deans of, of colleges that you work with. It could be um, leadership elsewhere uh, in your organization as well. And I mentioned highlighting other teams um, and their successes. And this is where 
uh, secondary audience considerations become important. So you may hand this off to uh, the head of IT and they like it, that's good. They may hand it off to someone that is outside uh, of, that, of that scope. So things to keep in mind, um, here's a list of potential audiences, you know, organizational leadership, you know, industry or professional associations like, like this one. Uh, you may even find that it gets passed on to local, state, federal officials. We, your impact statement may be seen by a, a grantor organization from the federal government. Uh, so that is why I highlighted secondary audience there. Okay, so now you've seen one, but, but why do you actually need to use one? A good impact statement will tell the story of your successes to the right people in the right way and really on your terms. Um, you get to highlight what you're doing that's making a difference to the organization as a whole. And it allows you to highlight those other teams and their contribution that I mentioned. Um, highlighting the activity can use those metrics, right? We talked about metrics, but here on the right in this, in this gold Purdue colored uh, box, we have a quote from one of our faculty members. And I won't read it all, uh, but the two highlighted bits, I think if seen by a primary or secondary audience member as, as I've termed them, you have most of the time IT isn't connected, like without acknowledging whatever's going on around it, those words are pretty powerful. Uh, the last bit highlighted there is that whatever the words around them are greatly expands the scope and profile of my research. So if I am that faculty member's department head, I'm a collaborator, I'm, I'm whatever I am, those two things stand out to me and I wanna know more. Um, the other one here is, you know, industry specific groups, but also your supervisor. It, for many people, it is annual review season. Uh, many of us could, myself included, probably and should do a better job of keeping our successes over the previous year organized for easy access. Um, if you're creating consistent impact statements, not only are you telling your stories all year long, but you can easily produce them. So when you get to that point of, so tell me what you did this year, you have something to say besides, um, I came to work, right? And I've been in those conversations on both sides of that table. This, uh, I, I think, helps narrate not only your team success, but to a certain degree, your own. All right, now here's an example. Um, this is the same, the same event is being written about throughout this entire presentation. So it may look different, but it's all about the same event. And, and that'll be important to, to illustrate how you can sort of model these to fit your situation. But what we've got are really four key sections. So you have an issue, a problem, whatever the thing was that you solved. Uh, why is the story worth telling and who does it matter to? These are the things that you need to touch on to sort of act as your setup, right? It's a story, you're telling a story. Uh, the second real section, I'm gonna skip over here. Actually, you don't have a laser pointer, hold on a second. There we go. Uh, the response section, you know, what did you do? You need to be concise, but you also need to be specific uh, with, with things that will resonate with that audience. So solved problem, not enough. Uh, you also don't wanna write three pages here. So in this example, you know, we have some examples, some acronyms. Um, there's, there's one of those redactions. Uh, what happens, what we did. The important part, the real important part here is, is this section, the impact. Why does it matter? This is probably gonna be your longest section. What challenge was overcome? What'd you improve? Uh, here you can use some of those metrics. Um, again, they'll vary by your field, but this is really to answer the so what. Uh, this, this over here, this little gold box, um, we like to, where possible, use something like this to sort of highlight any tech discoveries or important things, uh, bigger takeaways. I know this is a one page document, but you may find people in your selected audience that are, we'll call it too busy for even a one pager. Uh, the gold box, you know, maybe all they see, or it may be the chance to hook them into reading the whole document. Um, let me turn off my laser pointer. Here is another one. If you've got the space, you can go bigger. Um, I, actually, I'm gonna skip back real quick. Here's a picture of, of actual people uh, that that work here. Uh, so this isn't a stock photo. And the person on the left, you may have seen before, or at least seen the name is Mark Sullivan. And these are other members of, of various teams. Pictures are great at telling stories. I want to make sure I touch on that, but not everyone has a catalog of photos they've taken doing whatever it is they're doing that is worth describing. You should start, but if you don't have any, um, stock photos can still help tell your story. So 
we hear of on the left, uh, a, a picture of corn. That could be anywhere in the Midwest, I'm gonna guess August-ish. Uh, but this is basically the same version you just saw, but in two pages. If, if whatever your medium is allows this, or you feel like you have room, go ahead and use more. Uh, this is a quote that I don't know who to attribute to. I, I think that uh, I use it a lot in my own life, but it, it's modified for here. But the, the quote is, people believe stories and feelings and not facts. And you can probably think of instances in your life where that is, that is wrong true. Uh, but our goal here is to make our audience feel our success and its impact. So, you know, if you can use examples that resonate with people, not all metrics that matter are KPIs, dollar signs, budgets, uh, installation timelines. I know we work in IT and I know what, what we uh, likely focus on, but that isn't always the so what. Sometimes that's the map. Um, you know, and sometimes the, the team, how your team responds actually is the story. So this, this is an example and in, in the photos or pictures tell a thousand words or save a thousand words, however you want to look at it. Uh, this is a wireless access point uh, for a rural research plot in, um, I think, Southern Indiana. So there were some sensors out here and this was the subject of our example so far. There were some sensors that needed to be connected uh, in such a way that the area where this is doesn't have cell service to a great extent, definitely doesn't have Wi-Fi. This mobile trailer enabled us to park it here, have the sensors talk to it, and then it could talk back to wherever it needed to talk back to. Now, I mentioned that sometimes change happens slowly over time, and you have to show how you dynamically manage through it, but sometimes change happens the very next day. So this is that trailer under about three feet of water. Um, there's an entire other impact statement that could and, and probably should be written about the four, three or four different teams responses to this part of the situation. The first part of the impact statement that, that we had talked about, the example that I gave, was getting to the picture on the left, getting to the trailer. The, that's a story in and of itself. The second story is how we salvage this. Um, you know, this, this picture brings feelings. And so those involved, our audience, primary and secondary, when you see these two things side by side, you think about things. It, it does start to evoke that like, oh man, what happened here? Uh, this is a, a great way to help tell stories. Now, not every, I hope no one else has a flood picture. I really do. But as you start thinking about making impact statements, potentially think about things like, like this. Um, knowing your audience is key. Right, we've, we've talked about who our audience is, but it probably won't be the same for anybody else out there. But we can probably move it into two buckets. We've got internal and external. So for our purposes, internal audiences, we would consider reporting up. So any, anyone inside Purdue University, whether that be within Ag IT, uh, the College of Agriculture, or even beyond, I consider reporting up. Um, you know, other teams that I work with within my own department, uh, but also leadership, right? So there's who you intend to see something like this versus who could see it. Uh, you know, the provost, uh, the president's office, this could get places. So make sure that when you're creating these, um, that you're acknowledging that it, it could be seen by people that you're not expecting it to be seen by. And it's generally a good thing. If, if we pass something like this on and say, here's an impact statement for this trailer install, uh, and the things that went along with that, and someone says, wow, I want to share this, it's probably a good thing. Um, external audiences, you know, that'd be reporting out, and we'd previously talked about uh, IRB concerns or, or things like that, but you could report out with, with uh, an impact statement to professional organizations like this one, uh, peer organizations. I've given not talks about impact statements, but other talks to other universities, um, but you also need to be mindful for jargon and terms that are unique to your organization. So I'll, I'll give an example here. If I put ITAP, I-T-A-P, on an internal document that was going, you know, one of these that was going internally, everyone would know that that means information technology at Purdue, right? It's our IT department. But if I was intending for this to go out, I would go ahead and spell out information technology at Purdue or some version of that to make sure that the people reading it understood what I was talking about. You likely have your own um, versions of those things. Another important thing is to you know, be consistent in delivery. 
Uh, we try to be consistent in timing, pick an interval and stick to it. If it's only annually to start, everybody has to start somewhere. That's okay. Um, if you, if you wait for a very important thing to do one, you'll probably miss some, uh, that actually are important. Everybody gets busy. Everybody has other things besides creating an impact statement. I recognize that this is probably a heavy lift for, uh, most people creating the templates we created and, uh, you know, from concept to execution to giving this talk was, was no small feat. But if you can stick to that interval, it will really help reinforce the consistency of not only that you're making a difference, but who it's coming from. And so your, your audience can grow over time. Um, as you do more of these, your secondary audience will definitely grow. As you start including more teams in them, uh, you know, so BRM does one, our, our, uh, our systems people do one, your, your version of whatever the separate teams are can do one. And if you're mentioning each other in them, uh, you're highlighting everyone else's successes as well as your own. Um, sharing is good. I'll just reiterate that. Uh, the look, look is important. Don't be rigid. Like you can improve and adapt it. And here on the next slide, I'll show a few examples of how uh, we've kind of evolved over the last few years. But from my perspective, one of the keys is that you want to make sure that whoever's reading it knows it's coming from the same group or program or person each time. So in our example, you know, we have Purdue colors and fonts, graphics, these kind of things can change without you having any say in it. Um, so here is three years ago, two years ago, last year. Uh, our hope is that someone could pick this up that has experienced one or all three of them and know what group it's coming from. Um, you know, colors, fonts, those things can be changed by your marketing division um, or whatever, whatever have you, uh, and you have to adhere to them. But that doesn't mean that you can't also grow and stylistically change. You'll notice that the level of pictures has definitely gone up. Um, I think that it's important to stay uh, interesting looking just so that you're, you know, captivating that audience when you can. Uh, let's see. Okay. So you're saying, yeah, Brandon, we've, we've collected metrics. Um, I think they're important. I agree with you. All this stuff sounds great. I, I'm hoping. How do I actually build one of these things? Uh, we have found through, I guess, a pilot program that if you give someone the end result and say, make this, uh, you get a, you get a different end result than maybe you're expecting. Um, people have different writing styles, different levels of, uh, verboseness, verbosity. So templates can help you not only organize your own thoughts, but they can help ensure consistency. Uh, this is an example of our template, and this will be provided after the webinar as well, so you don't have to try to screenshot the little bit here. Um, this serves a few purposes. One, it ensures that we have a consistent uh, layout. You've got, the, you've got the four main sections here that we already talked about. Um, you've seen those formatting examples. Uh, it enables you to kind of tailor it to your organization's need. If you're trying to fit everything on one page, um, then you don't want someone that will write a thousand word essay on each of these. You also don't want someone that will give you not even one complete sentence, like a bullet point. And we got both of those examples when we, when we attempted to do this the first time. So human nature is to fill the box. So if you make your box the right size and you do some other creative things with like font and formatting locking, uh, you can end up with something that kind of uh, truncates itself to how long it needs to be. Um, this is really easy to distribute and complete. Your, whoever is in charge, so let's say it's my supervisor, and she says, whatever this was, saving the trailer from the floodwaters was very important. It was a success. We need to tell everyone about it and how well it helped that faculty member continue his research at another location um, with very short turnaround, given a lot of logistical issues. Here's this thing, fill it out. Um, it, it's helpful if they understand what they're supposed to look like, the person writing it understands what the end result is supposed to be, but you can, you can really work with one of these things to help fill in um, the, the final sort of pretty product. Um, you know, like, it, yeah, I mentioned it's structured to assist. Oops, it's structured to assist with variable writing styles. Uh, the last point here I do want to touch on, and that is have a review process, even if it's informal. So 
if you don't want to designate someone to be the official impact statement reviewer, have, or you can't find someone with that kind of time, uh, find someone in your peer group, in your department, outside your department, especially as you're just starting out. Uh, I found it very helpful to be able to bounce ideas off of, off of people. Um, if you can't find anyone that even knows what you're talking about because no one's heard of an impact statement, you have this group here. Uh, there, there's probably someone that's been doing a version of this without calling it this. Um, and as a last resort, you probably have me. Like I'm, I'm happy to entertain an email question or a short meeting about, hey, I want to do this, but I, I'm stuck on whatever. Uh, and I offer that up because I think they're important. And I think the more of them are done, the more widely they'll be recognized out in organizations and industry. Um, because at least in my case, teams like ours sometimes have a difficult time sort of, well, quantifying the things that we do uh, in, in an era of tighten budgets and you know hiring freezes, et cetera, as we're all coming out of the, the impacts of COVID are still in them, depending on where you are. Um, this is one more arrow in your quiver of look at what I do and, and why it's helpful. Um, so once you have this, and this is the same thing from the last one, from the last slide, you just fill it in over here. And I know it sounds simple because it really is. Um, this, both of these exist in a Word document and the formatting is, is been sort of locked up so that people can't really change things. Um, uh, we found that to be helpful as well. But when you have this, it, it helps. You know, we have a few of these, a few versions of this thing on the right here that one, if you have a photo in this aspect ratio, and one if you don't, like we, we mentioned the, well, you saw the corn one with the stock photos. So don't have just one if you have the time to create more than one, by all means, uh, but it really is a matter of copy paste and then have a couple people review for grammar, jargon, things like that. Um, some considerations when you're doing this. Uh, rights management is a thing. Um, you know, observe and indicate copyright information. This, this down here in the right-hand corner with the big red arrow, that's been on every slide so far. And most people probably didn't notice it. Kudos to you if you did. Uh, that is at the, I don't even want to say request, that is at the, uh, the orders of Purdue's legal team. I contacted them to let them know I was going to be giving this talk and that we would like to share a template. Um, we were going to be sharing Purdue-owned work product with a non-Purdue entity. And so we needed to observe copyright information. We also needed to make sure that we had the rights to use the photos, and we do. Um, and these are general things, but if a photo is taken outdoors or in a public area where there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, generally you don't need permission, but it's a good idea to ask the people, especially if it's like four people standing next to each other, or at least notify them um, if possible. I did mention stock photos earlier, but stock photos also have copyright owners. There's a photographer out there somewhere that's trying to get paid for that. So if you have access to a, a shutter stock or something like that through your employer, uh, use those because then at least the rights are being managed. If you just hit Google and type corn copy paste, like that will work, but there is a potential that you are getting yourself in a potentially litigious situation later and it's best to avoid it. And it's easy to avoid it, just cite things. Um, quotations, uh, I, I uh, redacted the faculty member's name for the quote that we talked about earlier. In the internal version of this, it's, it's there, everyone knows who it is. Um, but depending on the direction you're reporting, either up or out, your own version of Purdue Legal uh, or IRB or whoever, or marketing maybe, may have their own things to say about that. Uh, basically, confirm with your organization before you're sharing something out that you created on their time. Um, finally, I'm not a lawyer. None of this constitutes legal advice. Uh, if you think that you might need one, you probably do. Uh, not to say that this is an overly cumbersome part of this process, just that it is something that you need to be concerned about. Um, it looks like I have gone a little faster than I anticipated, Mitch. So at, at a half hour mark, yeah, I, a lot of I hope I didn't for, leave anybody uh, in the dust. Show. Yeah. So I'm open for Q&A. Maybe that's yeah. more time. Maybe we had a bunch of questions. Yeah. And so since we do have a lot of time, um, not only just drop your questions in the Q&A, and I'll, I'll jump on Lisa's question here in a minute. But if you want to actually take, if you want to be taken off mute to speak, um, let me know, raise your hand, and I will take you off mute to speak. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the one question that did appear on Q&A. So uh, Lisa's asking, um, 
how do you just, yeah, I'm actually funny. I was going to ask uh, you that myself and how do you distribute these things? Yeah. Um, your audience, we talked a lot about who represents what audience, um, you know, internal, external, secondary, primary, things like that, but how you distribute them is important. Uh, we actually print these things. Uh, even in, even in COVID times, um, we have found that when we can get in person, distributing these things is like a glossy, this comes out of, uh, you know, a, a legitimate print shop kind of thing really helps it. Uh, we found, we've seen examples of them like on desks later. Um, you can definitely email them, right? Clearly we can do this virtually, but knowing who to distribute to and how to distribute it, I guess are two questions that are separate. Um, anybody that's a stakeholder in the work you're doing, I think is a valid option for who to distribute them to. Uh, and you may get some, what is this? Why do I care? Uh, maybe that's not a person that gets it next time, or maybe that person needs to keep getting them. And that's, that's a determination you'd have to make uh, based on your own unique circumstance. But uh, the three examples I showed you, um, and I'll just click back to those. So these are all pages out of uh, a larger annual report that we do. Um, it's 15, 20 pages long. It's also physically printed. Uh, it's glossy. So these were kind of the impact statements before discrete impact statements, before we started this creation process. Um, I have received a lot of positive feedback from people that have read them uh, or people that knew what I did uh, because I've only been here a couple of years, but these predate me. So there have been people that I've introduced myself to around campus that knew of our program because they had come across one of these at some point in the past. Oh, you work for that team that puts out that report. And maybe that's all they knew, but that could potentially be my end to continue to help build, facilitate, cement that relationship. Um, it was it was interesting that the first couple of times, but it it is something that I believe. Oops, there we go. Uh, believe does have value to be physically printed. Uh, you can definitely, hey, I'm also going to email this to you too, kind of thing. Um, but again, be careful about distribution. It's a lot easier to control. That, that one that's earmarked for internal use, the one that's got the jargon in it and the names of people, uh, that needs to stay on campus, so to speak, even if it's not a campus that you work on, which it probably is, um, because it's, it's physically on paper and then it's up to that person handing it around. Uh, email goes everywhere and the internet is forever. So I may have just talked for like three minutes and not answered your question. So Mitch, did I answer that question? Yeah, just the sources like email, print, right? PDF, uh, SharePoint site, right? Push pull hmm. kind of method. Um, yeah. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, to, there are all those distribution methods make sense. Um, you know, we utilize SharePoint, but I don't believe we would use SharePoint to, to put a document like this out. I would say that our distribution is a little more targeted. Um, for the annual report, maybe not, but since we're talking about in impact statements in this conversation, um, we generally know who our stakeholders are. Uh, that said, you know, I, as I mentioned a couple of times in the talk, sharing is good. So the, the more it gets out there, I, I can't envision a situation where somebody would pick one of these up and go, boy, these people are really wasting time, at least not. Right. So uh, these we got two questions that came in that I think have a an, uh, one answer, at least an answer, a combined answer. So um, okay. first question here is, so how do you prioritize what to report on? And then related question, how do you determine what events that you create these impact statements for? Yeah, uh, sometimes it's it's obvious, right? Like the flooded trailer, uh, that one's pretty obvious. The, the, the push behind creating the one of like, okay, we drug a trailer that does mobile Wi-Fi down to a field. If I just say it like that, it doesn't sound like much, right? It sounds like somebody's job to, to drive a trailer around. Um, it's the story of, of what, that, what that solved that is the important part. Um, and I will freely admit when I started doing this, I felt the same and had the same questions. Like what, what counts? Um, and if you're there, you're, you're probably doing stuff that counts. Uh, step back and ask, why you're doing the thing you're doing, right? There, there's everyday work. Sure, you're answering email or you're following a process or you're filing a report. Um, but hopefully you're, you're working on something that is improving some aspect of the organization. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something as simple as process improvement. You could be 
promoting the organization's reputation, even internally. It doesn't have to be external. Um, but in doing so, you can you can articulate why something is potentially better or fixed. Uh, you know, the the the, the flood example. It, it isn't that something's better, it's that something was kind of salvaged. Um, and I don't, maybe salvage is a strong word. The trailer is fine. It's, it's, been, it's been modified, right? We learn from our, it wasn't even really our mistake. We just learned from our experience. And so if, if you've learned something from experience, maybe you had a, an implementation of something that did not go well and you're like, well, that's not a success story. Um, but it was a learning opportunity and you will likely take away something from that that could help elevate or avoid elevate the organization or avoid some sort of potential negative impact in the future um you know if you can if you can fill out that template with a few sentences in each box i think you have something um you know it, it's up to you to really know what is important to your organization but if it helps maybe look at current initiatives mission statements um i know some of that stuff we hear and at least in my case, like, oh, so-and-so has changed the mission statement. And then this isn't really from my university time, but my time in the in the corporate sector, I would say things like, oh, we've changed the mission statement again because it happened every year or so. Um, and it kind of rolls off of you. But you know, a lot of people probably put a lot of time and effort into coming up with something like that. So if it helps to be in tune with your organization's uh, culture and values, you know, that might be a way to kind of direct your focus. Um, did I get both of those, Mitch? So I think you're saying there's no really no formal like criteria no. or scoring card that you use to prioritize. Uh, no, and, um, and not to say there could be, right? I'm not the expert on this thing. We, we created this template about a year ago, less than a year ago. Um, we've used it a few times. So it's not like we've done a hundred of these things and I suspect it will evolve. But you know, if, if, you're, if you've got enough, if you've got enough potential stories that you're using a scorecard, good for you. Um, and I would love to see it if you develop a scorecard, because I think there's probably some some potential there. You, you didn't know you'd have homework after this, huh? Hey, no, but I love learning things when I give talks too, so. Yeah. Okay, um, we actually ran out of questions. Hopefully, Anika, that, that answered your question about prioritization. Uh, why don't we just give one, two more minutes. Anyone want to throw in a question before we end? And I've offered a couple of times, so I'm gonna advance the slide. This is my contact information. Um, yeah, I yeah, appreciate uh, giving you that can information dump, to our audience. Yeah, you can dump any of that in the any emails that go out to if you like, Mitch. Okay, yeah, definitely do that when I send the recording and other artifacts out. Okay. All right, well, I think that will end it for today. Um, this does conclude the series uh, in this pre presentation. Oh, well, let me uh, answer, let me get this question here that Kelly just put into a Q&A. Sure. So she's asking, how do you know if you want to do an impact report or a regular story or an annual report item? Uh, okay. Um, the annual report for us has uh, you know, a section of what I would call impact statements uh, within it already. We just didn't quite have the terminology there yet. Uh, it, it serves as a more broad, hey, here's who we are, here's what we do, why we do it, and here's why it matters. Um, the impact statement is a, is a smaller, it's like chapter three of that. This is a story of why it matters. Um, whereas the annual report can hold those, it could also be a more generalized or for a more generalized audience. I think if you were going to, it wouldn't hurt to do both, but if you want to start somewhere, starting with impact statements of a little more targeted um, audience might be where you would go. And if you start having enough of these that you feel that you can write more, then uh, by all means, an annual report can also really serve to, to highlight your program. Um, so how to know when to do one or the other. For me, I think if it was a discrete event, um, you know, it doesn't mean it happened at two o'clock on a Tuesday, but the, the example I gave was several months in the making, but it all sort of culminated with that one thing. If you can write the story about that, that one thing, and it has a so what component to it, then I think it's worthy of an impact statement. If you can stack a bunch of those together, maybe put it in an annual report. Um, and an annual report can be, you know, it can, it can also have that pie chart with the, the, the metrics and the graphs from years ago that you still track or whatever it might be. It can encompass more, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. 
All right. Well, thank you, Brandon, for sure. sharing with us uh, your time, giving your time, and sharing your insight with us. Uh, his contact information is on the slide here. I'll make sure that gets out. Um, as soon as we end this uh, webinar, you'll get a link to um, survey to give your feedback on the survey or on the event itself. So, if you would take a moment to complete that survey, I'd appreciate it. Um, the chat transcripts, all the, the recording, all the templates uh, will be provided within five business days and will be archived on the Educause ITSM website. It's a good place to view past events and all of the upcoming events. We've got a lot of events still to happen, uh, so be sure to take a look at what's coming up. And as always, we are looking for fresh ideas. So if you've got a topic that you want to present on, um, I'm happy to help host that for you. So reach out to me, you have my email address. Again, thank you, Brandon, and thank you everyone for uh, spending your time with us today. Yes, thank you, everyone. All right. Have a good day.